I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. I'm often asked when people find out that I'm, I'm studying the Bible, um, what's my favorite passage of the Bible? And I usually say all of it, because I can't pick one. Uh, but it's not any less godly to pick one, right? Or to, to pick a few. And if you, if you ask the New Testament writers what their favorite portions of Scripture are, this would be near the top, if not the top. Uh, psalm 110 is quoted more than any other psalm in the entire New Testament. And it is for a good reason. It, it's not for the reason that it is more inspired or more authoritative than any other part of the Old Testament scriptures, but that it's, it's very convenient to be able to cite from this passage, which already centralizes and draws from a, a wide number of Old Testament texts and theologies and gives rise to later Old Testament prophecies. So as we look together at this text, uh, it will be quite a dense time of looking at uh, a network of texts that are connected, and, and together they serve to glorify Jesus. And that's what we're here to do. So let's read Psalm 110 together. A Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chief over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. It says it's a psalm of David, and there's a very good reason for that. David, the king of Israel, the first legitimate king of Israel, is one of the greatest heroes in the Bible. His story is the stuff of legends. Uh, he was introduced to Saul with this following praise in 1 Samuel 16, verse 18. He says uh, he's introduced by one of Saul's servants as the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who was skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, Prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. He's the whole package. And we know in the following chapter, he took on Goliath. He fought lions and bears. He survived Saul, who was demon-possessed. He was first legitimate king of Israel, who was after God's own heart. He united the divided tribes of Israel. He defeated all the enemies around him. And he had an elite class of warriors. You know, might attracts might. He was himself a warrior, and therefore he was surrounded by mighty men of valor. And you read about that in 2 Samuel 23. Uh, it's towards the end of, end of David's life, and you read about his elite killing squad, as it were, and there were concentric circles of men who served around him, the, the three the, of the most elite people that are around him, and, and you can read about them. One of them, Joshua Bashabeth, was the chief of the three, and it says, he wielded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. And next to him, among the three mighty men, was Eliezer, the son of Dodo. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who gathered 
who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines with, until his hand was weary, and his hand hung, uh, clung to his sword. His hand got tired just slaying the Philistines. Then, of course, you have the three men who broke through the ranks of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem for David. They were courageous men because David was one of them. David was the best of them. David knew real strength, military escapades like none other. He brought nations to their knees. He had every worldly reason to dwell on his strength and greatness and trust in the sheer power of his secret service, service as it were, or the MI6. I don't, I don't know what the equivalent is. And some of us do too. Some of us are gifted. God graciously grants us gifts. You may have a great support group, great relationships, great family, assets and accomplishments. But we learn that these things that that David had in his possession were not the things that made him great as we know him. In all his years, David wrote many psalms, as you know, but none were in honor of any of his mighty men, as mighty as they were. Because, they, because David knew there was only one mighty man that he could count on. All of his life. He was David's true hope. He was the Messiah. All the mighty men served David. But David himself served one mighty man. The mighty God-man. His Messiah. You see, David was not great because he did great things. But because he, he knew great things. About the Messiah. And what he knew far surpassed what he accomplished. But we also know that David's story is not just a story of success. His story is a story of failures. And we can list uh, um, many of them. He was, not, he, he was supposed to be um, not just a military leader of Israel, but also a moral compass. And, and we see this in Judges, the time of distress and confusion and disorder in Israel when the recurring statement that explains the condition that Judges was in was what? In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. What's the implication? And what comes right after that? Ruth, who introduces to us David's great-grandmother. So the king in Israel was supposed to be the king who transforms people and unites them and be a moral compass at the least and at best transform them into law keepers as Moses envisions in Deuteronomy 30. But we know that David was far from that. He was he's far from being able to change the people. In fact, in, in, you read in 2 Samuel 5, he goes to take Jerusalem, he goes into Jerusalem to make it its capital city, and there's a curious phrase there, there's a curious story. Uh, and it's almost an aside, and you, you don't really pay attention to it unless you're looking for it. It says, he drove away the lame and the blind from Jerusalem. And it says, because David hated the lame and the blind. David hated the lame and the blind. You know, when Jesus goes into the temple through the triumphal entry, he goes into the temple and one of the first things he does in Matthew is he heals the lame and the blind. He also gets rid of them, but in a very, very different way. He makes them walk. He makes them see. See, David is inherently flawed. 
He couldn't transform or heal the people that he reigned over. And of course, he had many wives and concubines. He lusted after Bathsheba. He took her from Uriah, his, one of his mighty men, and arranged for his murder. He was then chased by his own son, Absalom. And you know the tragic story. And even there, you can see David's own inadequacy expressed by himself in, in, a, in a highly emotional passage. You can see and feel his sorrow when he says in 2 Samuel 18, 33, as he sees his rebellious son hanging from a tree, pierced and, and killed by one of his own generals. Absalom, my son. My son, Absalom. Would I had died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David couldn't die in his son's place. He was a failure. But he was inherently pointing to someone who would and who could. His own son, his greater son. And even in the end, when he was tempted by Satan to rely on his strength and take census of his of his people, he was the reason that many Israelites died. Instead of being a savior, he kills his own people. This is a, a story of failures. But he knew what it takes to be a hero because he was in the office of the Messiah, but he could not handle it. He needed someone who, who was all that he could not be and needed someone who did or could do all that he could not do. David needed God himself to come down and become man and transform him and his people. He needed him also to be a priest who defeats Satan and wins a definitive victory over sin and Satan. Psalm 110 is the answer to that, answer to all of his failures. David prophesies about the one who was all that David could not be and could do what David could not do. You know, I was talking yesterday to some biologists at Oxford, and um, I asked them what they were working on, and they said that we're working on Parkinson's disease. That was a very interesting um, introduction. And so I thought, well, so what, is, what are you working on? So what causes Parkinson's disease? And, and I'll, I can never forget their explanation of what causes Parkinson's disease. And I'm sure some of you are in the medical field, so you'll correct me uh, later if I'm wrong. Um, but there is a, there's a part of your brain, it's called a black substance, that sends signals throughout the brain to numb the brain signals. And, and the reason is that your brain is constantly sending uh, neural signals through the nerves to move uncontrollably. And, and it, it's, a, it's a reflex uh, nerve signal that makes you, if it's uninhabited, shake uncontrollably and involuntarily. And this little part of the brain sends signals to the rest of the brain that sends signals to, the, to the, your hands and, and the rest of your organs to say, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And, and apparently, that part of the brain is, is dying in all of us. And it's just that those with Parkinson's that part of the brain is dying faster. So the, the analogy is that it's, it's of, a, of a race car ready to go. You've got the throttle down, but the brain has brakes on. In other words, the body is ready to fall apart at any moment. It's constantly falling apart. But God in his grace 
or orchestrated this mechanism to keep us peaceful and in control and not convulse involuntarily all the time with tremors. You know, if we were in David's position and you could read some of his psalms of depression and looking at his failures, you, you have to wonder why, why, he couldn't, why he wouldn't just fall apart. And he expresses that kind of sentiment in his psalms. There is something that kept him and held him together. And it's expressed in psalms like this. And you can see that in Psalm 22 when he thinks of his Savior dying for him. Psalm 16 when he talks about his Holy One who will not see corruption. And it's Psalm 110 that keeps him together from falling apart. And you want to know what you, how you can go through life without constantly falling apart. It's to know David's Savior. And that's what we, we're going to see in this psalm. And that's, that's the psalm of David. That's the significance of the psalm of David. This vision of the Messiah is an anchor to David's soul. It wasn't just fanciful thinking, but a faith-enhancing expectation. This was David's bread and butter. And um, I'm going to give you what David knew about the Messiah and considered everything to be loss for the sake of knowing, for the, for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. And I, I'd propose there are six things in the psalm that David knew about his Messiah that, that were an anchor to his soul, that kept his heart quiet, that, that kept his soul calm even in his failures. David knew that the Messiah had to be God. That the Messiah had to be God. That's verse 1. Let's read it. The, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The text actually says the oracle of Yahweh to my Lord. Uh, you can see the capitalization of the Lord. And I'm sure you know when you see the cap, all caps, the Lord appearing in all caps, it's, the Hebrew is saying Yahweh. So this is unquestionably God, the God of Israel talking to another figure that's not David, David's Lord. And it says, it's, the, it's an oracle of Yahweh to my Lord. This is prophetic language. From the beginning, David wants you to know that he's prophesying about the future of the Messiah. Psalm 110 anticipates this eschatological fulfillment of all the things that David was promised in 2 Samuel 7 and in, his, in the rest of his life in his communion with God. And so David calls him, my Lord. Yahweh said to my Lord, and you have to stop there and think, who can be distinct from Yahweh, but at the same time higher in authority than the king of Israel? Who? There's only God. And of course he says, it's my, it's my Lord. So it's a, it's a distinct person in the heavenly sanctuary. And David is, is uh, hearing this conversation between these two people. Sitting at the right hand of Yahweh signifies an exceptional degree of intimacy between God and David's Lord. In essence, Yahweh is inviting this Lord, and I would say he's the Messiah. We know this from the New Testament, that even Jesus talks about this in Matthew and other places, that this is the Messiah that God is talking to, and he's inviting the Messiah to sit at the right hand of his glory. Such intimacy was unheard of between human kings and Yahweh. Uh, for example, in 1 Kings 22, you, can, uh, you might remember the prophet Micaiah has a vision to see what goes on in the heavenly sanctuary. And he sees this in 1 Kings 22 verse 19. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. 
Notice there's only one sitting on his throne. And all of the hosts of heaven standing beside him on the right hand and on the left. So when Yahweh assumes, and this is consistent throughout the heavenly visions that you see in both Old and New Testaments, where there's only one throne in heavenly sanctuary. No one dares to sit when, when Yahweh sits. The heavenly hosts, the holy angels, they're all standing ready to do his bidding. And in the earthly tabernacle and the temple, as we read in Hebrews 8, which is a copy of the things in heaven that Moses wrote down, only the high priest could enter into this earthly tabernacle that represents the heavenly, and that to only once fearful for his own life because he himself was a sinner. In 1 Samuel 5, you know the the story of the Philistines. When when Israel gets defeated by the Philistines, Israel thinks, you know, we can use the Ark of the the Covenant as a a sort of a, um, a charm, a lucky charm to win against the Philistines. But they lose. So the Philistines capture the ark. And the Philistines think, well, we've, we've got the Lord. We've got Yahweh in our hands. So they take the, take the ark into the temple of Dagon, who is the god that they serve, who's an idol. And they place the ark next to Dagon. And you remember what happens. The next day they go in and Dagon has fallen on his face. Before the tabernacle. Before the the Ark of the Covenant. Because the truth is this. when When the God of the universe is in his sanctuary. No one can sit next to him. The only proper response. Of even a a false God. of, Of anyone else in the presence of God. Is to bow down. And as you know. Uh, this happens, they, they erect him again, and then he gets his head and hands cut off before the ark. So no one dares to sit in the place of God next to God. And later in 1 Samuel 6, you see the Philistines return the ark, and, and they say in 1 Samuel 6.20, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God, and to whom shall he go up? away from us. They're even afraid to stand in front of him. And to this and this God, David says, is saying to his Lord, sit at my right hand. Here we have a king who has full and uninterrupted access, not only access, but equality with God. He is the priest of priests, the king of kings, and the lord of lords. He is God. And and just as as another side note, there's only one throne, by the way. There's no picture of another throne being placed for this character. Uh, You read this in Revelation, and it's kind of confusing when you read Revelation. In 4 and 5, there's only one throne set up. And And you can see and read John referring to this throne, and there are two people sitting on the same throne. The Lamb and God. And you have to wonder the mystery behind it. There's only one throne, but two people are sitting and sharing in the authority and the reign and the essence of God. You see, this was the hope of Job. He hoped for someone, an arbitrator, who could lay one hand upon God and one hand upon man. And only God can lay a hand upon God. No man is able to do that. Human priests show that they can mediate God's presence, but only God can ultimately put his hand upon God. Already this verse expects and anticipates the priestly role of the Messiah, not just that he's God, but that he is a priest, the priest of priests, because priests have access into the Holy of Holies. But no priest ever dares to sit in the presence of God. There's no one like him, no priest, no angel, no king, no man, and no God, only David's Lord, the Messiah. He's like no one else. He's God, he's man, he's priest, and he sits at the right hand of Yahweh. 
And the word footstool, he says, until I make your enemies your footstool. There's so much evidence in this text and the rest of the Old Testament of the, of the deity of the Messiah. And I know this, it's been questioned recently, even in some of our circles, um, when they talk about some of us, some of the people that have left have talked about the, the Old Testament as only envisioning the Messiah as a human figure. But that's definitely not the case. And if you can see that even in the, in the reference to the footstool. If you just took, do a little search on stepbible.org, it's in English. And click on footstool and it appears six times. Go through every verse. Every verse is talking that, that mentions the footstool in the Old Testament. It's talking about the footstool of Yahweh. It's the, it's the temple and it's the earth, more broadly speaking. Now you come here and he says, I'll make your enemies your footstool. So of course, if you're one with Yahweh, you get the same kind of accoutrements and the... And the uh, things that he uses that are only reserved for him. The throne that is reserved for him is also shared by the Messiah. The footstool that is reserved for him is, is given to the Messiah. So you cannot say that the Messiah is not God. In fact, even Psalm 111 and 12 uh, buttress the fact that the Messiah is God. You see, in 111, it, it's almost like a and a response to 110, because you see in 110 that there's David's Lord who, sa- who shares the throne with God. And Psalm 111 talks about God as righteous and just. And Psalm 112 talks about this man who's also righteous and ju- just. There, th- these two Psalms are unpacking the truths that were embedded in Psalm 110 because they want you to see that the Messiah is both God and man and he shares in the divinity and deity of Yahweh. And that's why you see in Psalm 2.7 that God says to the Messiah again, you are my son, today I have begotten you. David knew and hoped for, not just that, you know, David, this is David's son. We talked about the Davidic covenant, and this is the promised son, David's son, son of David. Uh, And that he's the son of God, because he shares in divinity. But David knew a little bit more than that in this this text. Until I make your enemies your footstool. That, That language of enemies and making, that that combination appears the first time in Genesis. In Genesis 3, when God is talking to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and your seed. And the woman's seed. And the words put and make in Hebrew are the same. And of course the enmity are the same. So you have this text lingering behind this. And and just keep that in in your mind as we go through the text because it comes back. uh, It and make sense of the text a lot better than if you, if you don't have that in your, in your mind. So David thought and was inspired to write deeply about the Messiah. That the Messiah would be David's son, the son of David. And not only that, the son of God. And not only that, the son of the woman. The seed of the woman in Genesis 3. David knew that the Messiah had to be God in order to fulfill all of these promises. And let's quickly move to verse 2 where David knew another thing. David knew that the Messiah had to be man. And that follows uh, really well from our reference to Genesis because he is this, this seed of the woman. And it says, The Lord sends forth from Zion, in verse 2, Your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. The word rule there. It's a, it's a rare word for rule. And, and you'll only find that, uh, one of the first times you'll find that, is when God makes humans in Genesis 1 verse 26. And he says, 
Uh, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let, let him have dominion. Right? Dominion. That's the word. That's the verb. Rule in the midst of your enemies. And what do you know from the Genesis account? Um, he was, the man was supposed to have dominion over created things in the creation. But what do you read in the next chapter, in the next few chapters, is that instead of him having dominion over the created things, the, one of the created things has dominion over man. And David envisions this moment when God says to his Messiah, who who shares in this divinity, and tells him, rule in the midst of your enemies. Because why? Adam couldn't. Adam failed. David knew the Messiah had to be man. Adam failed to have dominion over the world, but the Messiah will succeed. The Messiah will rule over his enemies with his royal scepter, it says. God stretches forth his, his mighty scepter from Zion. And even the scepter pulls from the expectations of the Old Testament uh, about the Messiah. You see in Genesis 49.10, Jacob prophesies that the, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Numbers 24, a pagan prophet, Balaam, in verse 17 says, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab. Psalm 2, again, verse 9, it says, You shall break them with a rod, or or a scepter, same word, of iron. This is the same scepter that the Messiah, of the Messiah, that that Yahweh yields and sends forth into the midst of his enemies. David knew the Messiah had to be God. That he had to be man. To bring salvation to the world. And what does that look like? He also knew that. He didn't just know that there's this person that will come. But he'll know, he, he knew what, what he would do. Verse 3. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. In holy garments from the womb, <clears throat> womb of, of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. And I, I would say this is the, the third thing that... He knew that the Messiah will make, and pay attention to this because this is a hard verse, a new priestly humanity. That the Messiah, as God-man, would make a new priestly humanity. Like I said, this verse is hard because of difficulties in, in the original text and also just the meaning of it. What does it mean that your people will offer themselves freely in the day of your power, in the holy garments from the womb of the morning, <laughs> the dew of your youth will be yours? I, and like I said, new priestly humanity. And I'll just unpack each of those words and try to explain this, this verse. New. Uh, you can see that from the phrases like womb of the morning, dew of your youth. Womb, morning, do, youth are all words that stand for a beginning. Womb nurtures a new life. Morning is the beginning of a day. Do appears in the morning, which is the beginning of the day. Youth is a beginning of life. It may also suggest, therefore, that this is a beginning of a new era, a new age. And Isaiah later uses, in verse, Isaiah 60, verse 1, says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of Yahweh has risen upon you. And you see the same kind of language in Malachi 4.2. Um, uh, for, for those who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will shine, will rise with, with healing in his wings. So the day of the Messiah's power what begins a new age, a new dawn, a new creation. It's a turn of the era. And, and let me just unpack um, this a little bit more. Connected to this idea. We also know that David knew about the resurrection. Because, because Peter says. Peter quotes Psalm 16 and says. David was talking about the Messiah's resurrection. 
Isaiah 26, verse 19 says this. Your dead will rise, or will live. Their corpses will rise. That's, that's very clear resurrection language, right? But he uses language from this verse. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is as the dew of the dawn. And the earth will give birth, as in the womb, to the departed spirits. So David is saying that the Messiah's people, whom the Messiah will resurrect from the dead and launch a new age, will offer themselves in service to him. And you can see that in uh, coming to fulfillment, beginning to coming, come to fulfillment even now in our regeneration, can't you? The regeneration of our minds so that we can see God and see the beauty of Christ clearly and and that, that compels us to volunteer ourselves in submission to him. This is the purpose of redemption, isn't it? It is the same people, the priestly people that you see in Revelation 19. Uh, that are riding on white horses with, with white clothes. Clean linen. That come with Jesus as his new army. So if you're born again today, you are part of that inaugurated priesthood. You, as Peter says, you are a royal priesthood in 1 Peter 2. You'll gather around the throne of the Messiah as a priest of God with full access to him. And, and I also said new priestly humanity. Where do I get the priestly from? Pay attention to the words uh, holy garments. Again, if you do a little bit of search on that, every time you, you t- the Old Testament talks about the holy garments, these are the garments that priests wear. These are priestly garments that are only limited to the Levites. But here we have the Messiah's people, everyone who's part of the Messiah's people, wearing these holy garments. Again, the the picture from Revelation comes to mind. This is the doctrine that the New Testament develops of the priesthood of all believers. Every believer is a priest in the Messiah. Because, as, as Hebrews says, the Messiah has gone into the heavenly sanctuary... Therefore, we can draw near to the throne of grace as any priest could in the Old Testament. And what do priests do? They worship. And what are they doing here? Again, another point of of the Messiah's deity. What do you have when the Messiah has this new priestly humanity? Priests serve and worship God. And what are they doing here? They're worshiping Jesus. It's right to worship Jesus because he's God. And they do so freely. This is true power and true influence, something that David could only imagine. Have you experienced that? Do you feel compelled by the attraction of the Lord Jesus Christ that you could not but freely come and volunteer yourself to his service. We need to test ourselves and we need to quick, quickly move to a fourth thing that David knew about the Messiah in this psalm in verse 4. That the Messiah had to be priest. The Messiah is God. The Messiah is man. He'll make a new priestly humanity that he will also be priest. And this is, as I said, even invoked in the, in the first verses when the Messiah has, has free access to God in the heavenly sanctuary. And so the Lord has sworn, sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And why Melchizedek? We can go into a lot of detail. But let me just summarize for you. You, you find Melchizedek in Genesis 14. And Melchizedek is introduced as a king and a priest. So of course you've got the, the two um, parts of the of the rail that never meet 
in Israelite law, in the Mosaic law, come together before the law even was given in Melchizedek. And, and it says that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And of course, the Levites come from Abraham. And if, if the father of the Levites pays tithes to another priest, that he must be on a whole different level. That's the argument of, of Hebrews. And God promises that kind of transcendent priesthood in the order of Melchizedek to the Messiah. And the second thing that Melchizedek um, is known for is that he appears in the book of Genesis. And almost all people that you see in Genesis have a, a genealogy. They fit in neatly into a genealogy. But not this one. He seems to have come out of nowhere and goes um, without any trace. And that, the Hebrew, author of Hebrews says, is indicative of the eternal generation of the Son. Of Jesus, who has no lineage, human lineage, um, even though he does... Uh, um, from his mother and his, his father, but he's also eternally priest because he's the eternal son. The implication is that, um, I'm sorry, the third one is that Melchizedek is the king of Salem. So Melchizedek is the priest king. He appears without any genealogy in the book of genealogies. And third, he's the king of Salem. Jerusalem becomes a very important city in God's redemptive history. Uh, redemption of humanity takes place in Jerusalem. And whoever can capture Jerusalem gets to be the Messiah, the real Messiah. And, and what David does is prepare the way for that. And in he, but, but in verse 4, it actually says more, right? You will be... Priest for in the order of Melchizedek, and don't miss this word, forever. Forever in the order of Melchizedek. That's shocking because no priest in the Old Testament was a priest forever. Because priests are human and priests die. But God promises, He swears to the Messiah that you will be a priest in the order of Melchizedek forever. Somehow he's immune to the life shortening effects of death. He has the power of the resurrection. You can already see that in the previous verse. He, he raises people. He, he begins a new age of resurrection and of course he himself has the power to be resurrected. The Messiah brings together king, kingship and priesthood just as he brings together God and man and himself to reconcile the world to God. So at this moment in heaven, if your eyes of faith see Jesus at the right hand of God, you will see him interceding for you as priest in the order of Melchizedek. And I, I have to invoke Charles Spurgeon here, who beautifully summarizes uh, Jesus' priestly ministry. He says, The interceding priest has laid aside his blood-stained garments and put on his robes of holiness for glory and for beauty, jeweled breast, breastplate, ephod of gold and purple and, and blue and scarlet, mitre and fine linen and gold, and girdle of needlework the high priest wore on favored days. Our Lord is higher than the highest, and yet he stoops as low as the lowest. He's kingly even to deity, and yet so truly a priest that in all of our afflictions he's afflicted. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. Ruler of our race, he's yet partaker of our flesh and blood. He's acquainted with all of our sorrows. True king and true priest. David knew awesome things about the Messiah. But not just this, that he, he focused not just that the Messiah will be priest to intercede for his people, for, for sure that's what's going on now. But priests also have an important job, which is to 
to distinguish between good and evil and to pronounce judgment upon it in order to prepare ground for a holy God to dwell with his people. That's the main job of a priest, to mediate God's presence and prepare the ground for for God's presence to dwell on this earth. And you can see that David also has this in mind in the next few verses. David knew the fifth thing in verse 5, 5 and 6, that the Messiah will defeat Satan. Lord is at your right hand, it says, verse 5. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. What's going on? Uh, the right hand, that should, that should remind you of the first verse, right? Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. But here, this reference seems to be switched. It seems that the, the Lord, God, is at the right hand of, of the Messiah, And a lot of people are confused about this, and I think you should be. You know, in John, Jesus says, my father and I are one. When the Messiah acts, God is acting. And he says, when when my father is working, and so am I. And you can see the same kind of uh, ambiguity about the working, of, who, of who's working, even in the New Testament, especially in Revelation. So you, you have God working, and the Messiah is working. And what are they doing? Working, in verse 6. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. So you've got the kings shattered, and that's how this priest prepares the way for God to dwell upon this earth. And interestingly, he fills the earth with corpses. And if you know anything about priests in the Old Testament, one of the things that renders priests unclean is coming in contact with dead bodies. This priest, in his mission to cleanse the earth, for God to dwell upon the earth, defiles the earth. Because the earth needs a deep clean. You learn this from Ezekiel. And he shatters the kings so widely and so deeply that it takes Israel, Ezekiel says, seven months to clean up the mess. And I say the, David knew that the Messiah would defeat Satan. I think if you're following in, in the ESV, it says he will shatter chiefs. But Hebrew says... The Hebrew behind it, it says, he will shatter the head over the white earth. It's very clear. In fact, the LSB, the new translation, renders it that way. The the head. Again, I, I told you to keep a text in mind, didn't I? I'll put enmity between you, uh, your seed, and, and the woman's seed. He will crush your head. The son of God, the son of David, the seed of the woman will defeat Satan. That's what David knew. You know, David knew what it meant to fight Satan. When he fought Goliath, Goliath is described as this man who's covered in bronze. You have to wonder why. Because in 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 the Hebrew, the, the word for bronze, is, it, it sounds very close to serpent. Serpent. So David knew what it means to fight an agent of Satan, at the least. And David knew he couldn't do it. He couldn't actually slay Satan, the ancient dragon. He knew there's only one who will actually shatter the head of the serpent. Every man comes short when compared to this God-man, priest-king, who is David's son in his fight against Satan. And, of course, you think, job done, right? We can all go home. But the psalm has another verse. It says this, He will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he'll lift up his head. What is this doing here? It's almost like, okay, 
let me end with the shattering of the head, right? You've got, you've got the end of, of redemptive history. Let's go to heaven. David also knew, and this is the last thing in this psalm, not, th- not just the Messiah will defeat Satan, but then that he would definitively win. That's what you get in this verse. You have to pay close attention With this allusion to Genesis 3.15, there's also another side to the story, isn't it? He will shatter your head, but it doesn't end there. But you will bruise his heel. There's some kind of of, uh, a, a wound that he receives. And you have to wonder, what happened? And the verse says, he will drink from the brook by the river. By the way, and... He'll lift up his head. Of course, there's a play on words with his head, who, which is lifted up as he, as he crushes the head of the serpent. But there's a little bit more. What's this brook doing here? And, and this is where I think David is, is brilliant because he, he knows, and it's not just David, he's, he's receiving revelation, he's speaking in the spirit. And the Old Testament expects at the, in the end days, when the Messiah comes and defeats evil once and for all, the, the defining moment of that victory is marked by the fact that there will be a trickling of a river that flows from Jerusalem, from the temple, which marks the beginning of healing for the rest of the world. This is a river that gets deeper and deeper and deeper as it goes. And you can find this in Ezekiel 47, where he goes into, you know, he goes in, it gets deep. And and it says the, the river flows out of Jerusalem into the Dead Sea and makes the Dead Sea live. When the Messiah, with God, who is God, defeat Satan once and for all, the moment will be so definitive that the river comes, that the river starts flowing, and he will reap the rewards of his victory by drinking from it. As priest king, he will wipe all unholiness, all of the filth of this earth, with his victory by winning a definitive and decisive victory over sin and Satan. You know, David knew all of these amazing things and he put all of his eggs in one basket. We're given investment advice, that's not a good investment advice, is it? To put all your eggs in one basket. But it is in this case. May we put all of our hopes and expectations and and trust and confidence in this Savior who does it all. David knew that the Messiah is divine, so he can save him. That the Messiah is man, so he can be who no man has ever been. David knew that the Messiah will create a new humanity so that he will truly redeem his people. David knew that the Messiah will defeat Satan, only he has the ability to do so. David knew that the Messiah will banish evil once and for all, so that he will establish a new reality where there will be no longer sin, Satan, enemies, or barriers from fellowship with God. That is what anchored his soul, and that's what calmed his spirit. And may that come ours today as we dwell upon the sacrifice that this Messiah made just prior to the invitation for him to sit at the right hand of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for taking us into the heavenly places, giving us a vision of Jesus who is exalted who is matchless and who is glorious and who was David's only hope and who is our only hope. May we dwell upon him. 
May we rejoice in him. May we trust in him. And in doing so, may we be steadfast, immovable, and abounding in the Lord's work. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.